how that how that goes on and everything, Brother D. But what it is, it's called Pinnacles in the Desert. And, and you know, there's an isolated section, a coastline, about 150 miles north of Perth in Western Australia. And, and in this, in this is, lies the Pinnacles Desert. Now, it's a desert that's different from any other desert in the world. Why is that, though? Uh, because of the orange, the golden orange color of the sand. It seems that it has what they call undulating dunes. That means they just seem to rise and fall and everything. And it gives the landscape a strange and eerie appearance. But the thing that sets it apart is the actual pinnacles punctuating the dunes and everything. They're what really create the desert's extraterrestrial look. Okay, dog. So what are the pinnacles? The well, at this dip, Brother D, the pinnacles are basically columns of limestone, and they range in height from a few inches to more than six feet emerging from the golden sand, as though they were growing like some <laughs> subterranean root system. You see, the persistent wind constantly changed the dunes, so the columns grow and shrink, depending on the nature and the intensity of the wind, and the pinnacles vary in color. You see, most are yellow streaked with white, Others show pink highlights, and still others have twinges, tinges of purple and, and brown and everything. And the texture of these columns, they, they range from marble smooth to sandpaper coarse. Okay, dog, and then the first question that comes to mind is, when you see, see this desert is, where did these pinnacles come from? Duh, that's just it. The answer today it illustrates today's text we'll be reading later. You see, hundreds of years ago, the Pinnacles Desert was covered with sand, but for a period of several rainy years, it caused a hard calcified cap to form between the surface sand and the real deep sand. You see, and then plants started to grow on the surface of the sand, and they set down roots that penetrated the rock cap, and this started making channels for dissolved minerals to flow through the hard cap into the soft sand below. And see, be, being carried by water and everything, these minerals drifted down into the sand. And they began to build the equivalent of stalagmites in the sand. Stalagmites, like growing on a cave roof from the dripping of the water and the calcium. Da, that's right, Brother D. And that's the thing. These columns were growing under the sand, and no one knew they were even there. All right, dog, you got me. That is kind of funny, strange, but it's also one of the ways that God works. Duh. Well, that just did, Brother D. Eventually, the cat became so weakened that all, all the root channels, that it had broke down completely and everything. All those root channels, they broke down that rock cap. And, and the rainy period ended, and the winds blew the new sand in, and this suffocated the plants that were there. And so there was nothing to hold the dunes in place. And the winds that have blown the sand in now began to sweep it away, basically exposing the pinnacles for the first time ever. Well, dog, you never know when the actions that you think are well covered will be exposed for the whole world to see. Duh, that's right, Brother T. And, and, you know, it's important to live in such a way that you have nothing to hide. That's right, dog, and I know the text you're going to be talking about. That's Numbers 32, verse 23. Numbers 32, verse 23, it says, But if you do not do so, then take note. You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin won't find you out. Duh. That's right. And, and, and guys, remember, we, we, before you start gossiping and talking about somebody else and trying to expose chapters in their life that are kind of embarrassing, you might want to stop and think. You got chapters in the book of your life that you don't want read out loud either. <laughs> That's right, dog. You surely got that one right. I know I don't, but that's one of the things. So we need to remember, nothing can be hidden from God. Duh, that's right, Brother D. Now it's time for Pastor Brian. They often join the braves in hunting animals for food. He became experienced with the use of the bow and arrow and the gun. And Big Wolf talked, 
taught him to recognize animal tracks and caves that animals lived in. He taught George to recognize bruised leaves or slight scrapes on the tree trunks as signs of animals nearby. The weather was mild that winter and the snow light. This allowed George to spend much time practicing in the oval arena. Probably to help build his confidence, the teacher first drilled George on running, a sport that he soon mastered. Within a few months, George learned to outdistance the Indian boys of his own age and many of the older ones. Now the boys looked at him with more respect, and still the teacher continued to drill him at wrestling. Some days it rains, but the teacher did not let up. At evening, George would emerge from the arena black with mud. Mud caked his hair and his ears, and even his mouth tasted of mud. But George learned that winter to be a champion wrestler. Nobody felt more pleased about George's new success than Big Wolf. He regarded the boy proudly, and during council with the warriors often boasted of George's achievements. Swift Arrow has become a, as true an Indian as any of us in the village, Big Wolf would said, would say, soon he will be the bravest and strongest. Already his muscles bulge as hard as steel. And it was true. George had gathered much new strength during the winter, and on the long marches and hunting trips, he learned to endure cold and hunger as well as many Indians. But what Big Wolf did not realize was that George had not become a true Indian at all. He acted like one publicly, but privately his thoughts strayed to his home and his parents. He longingly, he thought longingly of the good food Ma cooked, and remembered the pretty fairness of his sister Zella and Robert's sister Becky. How they contrasted to the stern bronze maidens of the Indian village. Would he ever see them again? Every day now George prayed that God would help him find his way back home. He had lost all hope that Pa and the other settlers could ever track him down in this wilderness. But he still felt sure God would somehow lead him back to them. Spring arrived, and George rejoiced to see tender buds bursting from the brown tree branches. He and his friends raced their ponies along the wooded paths and through fields decorated with dainty wild flowers, yellow, orange, and purple. They passed men making new canoes and women planting the fields with corn and vegetables. George thought it strange to see the women working in the fields. But he knew that knew that was the Indian custom. Pa's probably planting his fields right now too, George thought. And I ought to be there to help him. Well, someday, I'll be there. Just wait. George made a new friend that spring. A tall, muscular Indian boy named White Rabbit. George judged the boy to be about his own age. They spent many hours together in the fields and woods, and had fun wrestling and racing each other in the arena. First one would win, then the other. Of all the Indian boys George had met, White Rabbit seemed the kindest and most understanding. But it was only to his little sister-in-law that George revealed the true secrets of his heart. When he felt sad and lonely, he would go to her and talk about home and family he missed so much. You would like it, Inwa. I know you would. The homes are made of made from logs. They are always dry, and the wind does not blow in. Ma and Pa sleep on a soft bed, and the rest of us... A bed? What is a bed? Inwa would interrupt. A bed? Why, it's something called a mattress that rests off the ground on top of wooden boards. Mattress is soft and stuffed with feathers from geese and ducks, and people lie down on the mattress to sleep. Inwa would look puzzled, but nod her little head as 
though she understood. Would you like, would you not like to live in such a warm house, Inwa? Oh, no, Swift Arrow. I am an Indian. I would die if I had to live in such a way. Then George would tell her about the good food Ma cooked. She made something called bread. It's made from grinding wheat grain, and as the squaws grinds the grain of corn. Ma mixes it up real good, and then puts it into long, narrow pans. When the bread is baked, it is the same shape as the pan. It has a hard crust on the outside and soft brown dough on the inside. It all giggled. I would like to eat such food, she whispered. Do you think you could make some? No, I'm not sure I could. I'm, I am sure I could not. George answered indignantly, Ma and my sisters did all the cooking. Cooking's for women, not men. How do women have time to make such food, Swift Arrow? Do they not hoe the fields and plant the corn? No, that work is left to the men who are stronger. Women keep busy all day with their cooking and other jobs like weaving carpets and cloth and knitting. Knitting? In while looked puzzled again. Sure, knitting. The women take the wool from the back of sheep and spin it into straw in a string. Then they take long needles and sort of loop the string all together so that it is smooth and warm and can be made into warm coverings for the feet and hands and neck. And Wash shrugged her shoulders. Well, I do not know what these words needle and string mean, but I'm sure it must be just as you say, a swift arrow. Then she would playfully pull at his dark hair, and he would chase her until they both fell down laughing. But Inua did not understand all that George told her about his home. She did understand one thing very clearly. She knew that she must ne never breathe a word of the things he told her to Big Wolf or any of the other Indians. If they knew that he still thought long longingly of home, they would probably beat him or maybe even kill him. One day, when George was hiking with Big Wolf through the forest, his curiosity got the best of him. More than anything, he wanted to know if Ma and Pa had been killed in the Indian raid or if they still lived. Surely, Big Wolf could tell him that much. As the two sat down to rest on a log, George finally plucked up the courage to blurt out his question. Honored Father, will you please give me an answer to one question that keeps me sad wondering? The chief's cold black eyes bored into him and George hurried on. <clears throat> the day I was taken from my home, I saw smoke coming through the windows of my house. Were my father and mother killed that day? But what about Robert, the friend that was taken with me? Big Wolf fixed George with a fierce look that seemed to freeze him to the log. George wanted, wanted to run, but his legs would not move. For a long time, the chief continued to stare at George with a look of pure fury. Finally, George could take it no longer and tripped backward over the log, scurried frantically into the woods. Would the chief kill him? For his daring question, get back here, Big Wolf roared, and the command stopped George in his tracks. He slowly returned and sat on the log. Big Wolf seized George by the shoulders and shook him like in was dog, he shook the long nosed rats he caught nibbling in the food storage place. I am your father, Big Wolf cried, as he continued to shake the terrified George. I am your father, and you have no mother. The big wolf stopped, shaking George, and the Indian suddenly looked very tired. Swift Arrow, 
you are not a prisoner here, he said in a gentler voice. You are with your own people now. Nobody so strong and brave and clever as you was born to be a pale face. You may have been born among the pale faces, but you were born to be an Indian. You are with your own people now, and you must forget the other days when you were a weak papoose. How dare you think of that friend of yours who is a sickly rabbit, weaker than a squaw. Forget him, and forget that other life. Never again speak to me of that which is not worth remembering. You will be told what you are to know. Big Wolf rose abruptly from the log and strode back toward the village. George followed carefully, followed, careful to be, careful to keep a safe distance behind. He may think he can make me forget my ma and pa, but he can't. George thought stubbornly. He can't tell what's going on inside my head. Someday I'll show him. For several days, Big Wolf ignored George, but gradually his heart began to melt. As he watched George play with the other Indian boys and follow the many Indian customs, he must have decided that George really was becoming a good Indian after all. He and George resumed their hunting and hiking together, and occasionally Big Wolf even discussed some of the business of governing the village with George. George listened eagerly and tried hard to please this chief who had obviously come to love him as a son. One of George, George's greatest ordeals was learning to swim. Water had frightened him ever since the time he almost drowned when he was about two or three years old. George watched the Indian boys and decided they could swim almost as well as the fish in the lake. But no matter how much time they spent showing George just the right motions to make in the water, George could not swim. Every time he lifted his feet from the lake bottom, his head would sink under the water, and he'd cough and sputter, thinking he would drown for sure. George's failure to swim became a great worry to Big Wolf. Every Indian boy must swim. Sometimes the ability to swim even saved their lives. The chief often reproached George about swimming and accused him of not trying hard enough. One day, the chief called George to him. Come, Swift Arrow. Today we will we'll take a canoe onto the lake and go fishing. George had often gone fishing, fishing on a lake with Big Wolf. So he expected nothing unusual. Instead, he gladly ran for their fishing lines and little pot of baits and was opposite Big Wolf in the canoe within minutes. Usually, George did the paddling on such fishing trips. But today, Big Wolf surprised him by reaching for the paddle himself. The slender prow of the light canoe cut swiftly through the deep blue water as the chief's powerful arms dipped and pulled the paddle. Not until, until they had got about a hundred yards from shore did he stop. What do you think we'll catch today? George asked eagerly. Big Wolf gave him an amused look. Today we will see a big fish swim. The answer puzzled George. Hadn't he seen many big fish swim? What he wanted was to catch a big fish. Oh well, who can know what the chief is thinking, George said to himself. Anyway, it's too beautiful a day to worry. After a few minutes of quiet fishing, the chief began struggling with his line. Big fish, big fish, he exclaimed. So soon, George asked, and he turned around to watch the chief land his fish. As he turned, a powerful shove and lift from behind sent, sent George spinning into the deep lake. Help! Help! George cried, swallowing big gulps of water as 
He opened his mouth and reached frantically for the canoe. But it was not there. Help! Help! George thrashed and kicked as he felt himself sinking under the water. Where was the chief? Why did he not help? The chief knew he couldn't swim. George's head bobbed to the surface, and what he saw made him regain his senses. The chief was paddling away, apparently not at all concerned about George's cries. The Indian did not even look back to see how he made out. Why, he did it purposely, George thought, when between the sputtering gasp for breath. He purposefully pushed me into the water, so I'd have to swim. Then George realized that he was already keeping afloat. He had unconsciously began moving his arms and legs as the boys had told him to do so many times before. But this time it worked. Now, what else had they said about swimming? He tried to remember the careful instructions, and before long he found himself slowly moving through the water toward shore. He capped his palm of the palms of his hands and pushed down on the water as though he wanted to push it under him. Then he kicked his feet in time with the movements of his arms. I'm swimming, I'm swimming, he kept repeating to himself. He looked towards Big Wolf's canoe and saw the chief had stopped but was carefully ignoring his struggling son. I guess he'd rather have me drown than have me continue such a babyish habit as being scared of the water. Now he began lifting his arms high over his head and putting them into the water, and he discovered the more powerful thrusts he made, thrusts made him move, move faster. He turned his head from side to side to take big breaths and kicked harder with his feet. The shore seemed to come closer and closer, then he noticed a large group of boys gathered on the shore. They were waving their hands and shouting something. Swift arrow swims! Swift arrow swims! He heard them call. When he reached shallow water, he put down his feet and walked to the shore. As the boys cheered, George began cheering too. He shouted with the rest of them and laughed when a few broke into a brief Indian war dance. George looked back at the lake and saw that Big Wolf had began paddling toward shore. When the chief came out of the water, he pulled the canoe onto dry ground and walked away without saying a word. He had a pleasant twinkle in his dark eyes, and George knew that he felt pleased. As the spring days passed to summer, George spent much time in the water. He learned to tread water, float, dive, and swim under water. By the beginning of winter, he was winning not only many land races, but water races as well. The first few winters George spent at the Indian village passed quickly for him because there were so many new things to learn. But by the time he was about 15, he began to dread winter. The experiences had grown old and no longer fascinated him. The cold winds and snows, snow made it impossible to wrestle in the arena or practice running and jumping. Much of the lake lay frozen, so of course he couldn't swim. Snowdrifts piled too high in the woods to risk riding Nico very far. But George noticed the lack of something to do didn't seem to bother the other braves. In fact, they welcomed the chance to sleep or rest lazily on piles of skin while they watched the squaws cook, make pottery, or sew skins together for clothes. The Indians must have thought it queer when they saw George come in front of the forest carrying huge loads of firewood for the squaw. Big Wolf looked questioningly at him, and finally a white rabbit called George aside and told him not to bother himself with Squaw's work. So now, what can I do with myself? George wondered silently. 
Then he remembered something. Robert's sister Becky had made a playhouse back in Germantown and how the girls had loved to play in it. It had been made big enough for the girls to walk around in. Some of the ladies furnished old dishes and a few kettles and Mrs. Stewart had even made some curtains for the windows. Why not make a play for house for in-law, George thought. She'd love it, and the other little girls would flock to it too. George could hardly wait to begin. First he searched in the snowy woods for logs just the right thickness. He even took his hatchet to chop down a few young trees. Then he hauled the logs to a clear area near in Las Wigwam and began the slow task of splitting them. What are you doing, Swift Arrow? And why? Asked the day he deposited the logs in the clearing. George just smiled. Please, Swift Arrow, tell me what you are doing. But it's a surprise. A surprise for me? Yes, for you. Will I like it? I hope so. Oh, please, tell me what it is. George refused to tell and just continued his work. Every day, Inwa came to watch as George notched logs and fitted them together. He built a little house, built the little house as he remembered his father had built their cabin in the settlement. What he could not remember, he improvised. In just a few days, the cabin began to take shape, and Inwa guessed what he was building. It looks like the log houses that you say your people live in, Swift Arrow. Is that what you are building? It is a little house, like the big houses of my people. When I finish building it, you can play with your friends. Inwa jumped up and down and cried a little cries of delight. Oh, Swift Arrow, you are the most wonderful of all brothers in the village. When will it be finished? You must hurry before the snow becomes too deep for you to work outside. If you're in such a hurry, then you can just help me. Can I really? What can I do? George showed Inwa how to mix mud and push it into the cracks between the logs just as he had done with his father's father year, years before. The mud will keep out the snow and cold winds. If you work carefully, your little house will be the warmest place in the whole village. For the next few days, Inwa's slender legs climbed all over the cabin as she carefully poked mud into the, into the cracks. When George finished the outside, he began eagerly on the inside. First he made a fireplace of sticks and clay. Then with his hatchet and knife, he fashioned a small table and two stools, fitting it their parts together with pins as Pa had done with the ones he made for Ma. He pegged crude shelves on both sides of the fireplace. Because of the affairs of the government he had kept the chief because of the affairs of government had kept the chief especially busy in that winter, George saw him little, but sometimes wondered uncomfortably just how Big Wolf would react to having his precious daughter playing in a pale-faced cabin. Would he be angry? One morning as George sat inside the little house smoothing logs for the floor, he looked out the door to see Big Wolf walking toward him. George hastily dropped his tools and stepped outside to meet the chief. It is good to see you, honored father. You have been working too hard lately. I see you too have been working hard. Every morning I look and I see the little house looks more nearly finished. Big Wolf did not smile as he spoke, and his eyes seemed to bore holes through George as they always did when he was angry. Just then, Inwa stepped out of her wigwam, seeing her, seeing her, the chief looked softened. Oh, Father, do you see the beautiful playhouse my brother has built for me? Is it not wonderful? And will I not have great fun playing inside? 
Come inside and see the table and stools and the fireplace that Swift Arrow has made. Big Wolf did as she asked and nodded his head in approval at the furniture. He ran his hands over the smooth tabletop and carefully examined the fireplace. Now winter will not be so tiresome for me, Father. I can play with my friends in my old house. And it, and is it not very warm inside? It seemed that Big Wolf could not be angry about the pale faced house when his daughter felt so delighted with it. It is good that your brother has made this house for you. Be careful when you play that you don't hurt yourself, the chief said. When he walked outside, the curious squaws noted that he was smiling. Now that the house had the blessing of the chief, it seemed that every squaw in the village wanted to see inside. Most of them had never seen a pale face house. Every day, old wrinkled grandmas and pretty young maidens came and poked their heads through the doorway and watched George finish the floor. When he had when at last he had finished, squaws began leaving little gifts inside for Inua. One brought a pair of brightly painted pots. Another brought an old kettle which George hung over the fireplace. Still another pretty set of china, a pretty china sugar bowl on the table. Painted brown flowers decorated inside, and a lid sat on top. George knew that it must be a prize brought by some raiding party. Finally, it was own old grandmother came with a fluffy brown bearskin and laid it proudly before the fireplace. Now that George had completed the house, he began working on another project. Every evening, Inwa saw him carving a small piece of wood. First, he worked it into a round shape. Then he began notching and cutting. He called Inwa to sit down before him and spent several minutes studying her face. When next she came back, she discovered that he had fashioned a little wooden head and that looked a great deal like her. Next he cut some doe skin from one of the skins he slept on, borrowed a bone needle and tough thread from the old squaw and began sewing. When he finished the sewing, he held a crudely shaped body. He fashioned arms and legs to it with leather thongs, and so they moved. When he had finished fastening the head to the body, George discovered to his surprise that the old squaw had been working too. She smiled a toothless grin and handed him a delicate bead of dress and tiny moccasins. Yes, this is just what we need, George exclaimed gratefully. He quickly slipped the dress over the head and the squaw nodded her approval. When Inwa saw the finished toy, she cried for joy. Oh, a baby, a little wooden papoose for me to play with. George laughed. My sister at home used to call these dolls and my grandfather in Germantown called them poppets. So, Inwa, I've made you a poppet. The squaw made a papoose board for Inwa, and she carried the doll on her back everywhere she went about the village. At first, the other squaws looked at the doll, doll suspiciously. Perhaps they thought it was a real baby, and, but when they at last realized it was a little toy, they began to wish their girls had one to play with. Thus, George kept himself busy many of those cold winter days making poppets for the little Indian maidens. Uh, we want to thank Pastor Brian for these stories he's been sending us and, and everything. We'll bring you Chapter 12 next week, folks. Uh, we, we really been enjoying it. This one was a little long, but that's okay. That's right, dog. It seems to work out just right today. Now then, let us end with another story that we trying to find here. I've lost it. Duh, I know, right? 
I've been having problems all day long trying to find what I've been looking for, Brother D. That's right, dog. But here's the one I've been looking for. It's called Tough Skin. Uh, wait a minute. I, I, I remembered this one. I, I think I heard Pete talking about this. That's right, dog. You heard it from Pete. <clears throat> now, perhaps you never thought of your skin being an organ like your liver, your heart, or your stomach, or even your brain. But it has special features and properties that give it that status of being an organ. In fact, your skin is your largest organ. It helps to hold you together, and it regulates your body temperature. I, I did not realize that. Well, it does. And the average person's skin covers about 18 square feet. And it weighs about 9 pounds. And you see a square inch section of your skin contains a yard of blood vessels, more than 3 yards of nerves, and about 3 million cells. Oh, wow, that's a lot. Yeah, well, that's just it, dog. You see, when you cut or puncture your skin, you feel pain because so many nerves signal the brain that an injury needs attention. Duh, yeah, and you don't do that deliberate either, do you, Brother D? <laughs> no, you don't, though. <coughs> excuse me. Duh, you're excused. <laughs> but you see, your skin varies in thickness from less than a sixteenth of an inch on your eyelids to up to an eighth of an inch on your back. Now, when you stop and think about that, compared with most animals, you're relatively skin thin-skinned. For example, an elephant's skin is so thick that the elephant can walk around through a forest of trees covered with thorns and full of broken limbs and never feel any discomfort. Duh, I didn't realize that, Brother D. That's right, and you stop and think. A shark skin is another example of thick, tough skin. It has specialized scales that are called dermal denticiles. Now, these are basically what it means is skin teeth and it covers its body. You see, and unlike typical scales, these dermal denticiles are embedded in the skin, and they're really tiny, and they can most easily be seen through a magnifying glass. Now, if you were to pet a shark, die, imagine that, petting a shark, right? That's a good way to lose some fingers and then time. Well, no, that's just it. If you, were to, if you were to pet this shark and stroke it from the nose to the tail, you think that its skin was very smooth. Okay, I, I, I'll try to imagine that. Well, I think it is. However, if you were to run your hand back the other way and everything, you might decide that you were rubbing sandpaper. Duh, okay, uh, why is that? Well, that's just it. Because you're rubbing the wrong way, they come up. And it's kind of like the hackles raising on your back when you get upset. Duh, I didn't think about that. But you see, here's the thing, though. With these razor sharp close set denticles, the shark can flay a large fish with a single sideways swipe of its body. Duh, you mean it doesn't actually have to bite, it can just come around and make a smack and that's right dog, he can open them up. That's the whole thing. But you see, while having thick skin might be an advantage if you're an elephant or a shark, you see, but God has given us a skin that is just right for our health and for keeping us sensitive to the world in which we live. I never thought about that. Well, here's the thing, dog. Have you ever heard of someone being described as thick-skinned? Yeah, I've heard that term. Well, what that means is that it's hard to hurt that person's feelings. Duh, yeah, but sometimes such a person may also be insensitive to the feelings of others. That's right, dog. Sometimes being thick-skinned is not a good thing. And, in fact... That person, he or she, might even hurt others without feeling responsibility for their actions. I never thought about that. Do you think that Jesus wants us to be thick-skinned? No, dog, he doesn't. He wants us to remember that we're supposed to love and help our fellow man. And today's verse comes from Job 10, verse 11. It says, Clothe me with skin and flesh, knit me together with bones and sinews. Basically, God made us the way he did, and we are perfect in the bodies that we have. The thing is, we need to remember we've also got to be sensitive to other people's feelings. And that's one of the things. Sometimes those words that you speak, you can't get them back. And they do more damage than you will ever know. So it's better to be kind. Uh, yeah, if you, if you can't be kind, you need to be quiet, right, Brother D? 
That's right, dog. Now, let us end with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for our many blessings. Father, we ask that you be with those that are traveling. Please keep them safe. Father, as always, we lift up the first responders, the firefighters, the EMTs, the law enforcement officers, the doctors and nurses, those that work hard to keep us safe. Father, we especially lift up our armed forces. They keep us not only safe, but they allow us to have the freedom to worship you as we see fit. Be with them and their families as these holidays get ready to come close. Father, help us to remember what the coming seasons are all about. Once again, we ask you, please be with us all. Bless us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Duh, folks, if you like what you hear on the radio, you can call us at 434-390-5981. That, that's 434-390-5981. That's right, folks. Or you can email us at emtx3xl at gmail.com. Again, that is emtx3xl at gmail.com. Once again, folks, we'd like to remind everybody, WGFW is a Christian radio station, and it always needs support. Please send your donation to God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Again, that's God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Duh, folks, don't forget, don't put the station call letters on there if you don't want to write out God's Final Call and Warning. Put GFCW. Again, that's GFCW. That's right, though. And as always, we thank Safe Haven Ministries for sponsoring Storytime. Folks, we know we've been having some technical difficulties. We are still working on that. Please bear with us as we try to get the satellite feed reestablished. Keep tuned in. Join us next Sunday morning at 9.15 for more Storytime. We will have Chapter 12 of Swift Arrow with Pastor Brian. Once again, folks... This is WGFW 88.7 on the FM dial, Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 9.55. We return you to the regular broadcast. Hopefully we will have it back up.